progress and change, which were thought to have been the cause of the French Revolution. Those Italians who wanted political change soon saw that their principal enemies were Austria and the Pope. Amongst the most outspoken of these was Giuseppe Mazzini. Mazzini was the first to advocate the creation of a unified Italian nation. He was a romantic nationalist who saw the struggle for independence as a means to political revolution. Once the Austrians had been driven out, the existing rulers and the Pope would be overthrown and in their place a new republican and democratic Italy would rise up. But there weren't a lot of Italians who shared Mazzini's ideas. Most people wanted to get the Austrians out of Italy, but few considered that the political unification of the Italian states was either possible or indeed desirable. They imagined that an independent Italy would take the form of a confederation of the existing rulers. But who would be the leader? Many thought they'd found the answer to this question when in 1846 a new Pope, Pius IX, was elected. Unlike his predecessors, Pius seemed to be sympathetic to moderate reform. It appeared that a major barrier to political change on the peninsula had been lifted and Pius soon became the idol of all those who wanted to create a confederation of independent Italian states. The revolutions of 1848 soon showed that the hopes that Pius had aroused were misplaced. The revolutions had begun because of the economic crisis that gripped the whole of Europe, not because of nationalist feeling. But in the face of rising tension, the Italian rulers gave political rights to the propertied classes. Things soon began to spin out of control. In February 1848, a Republican government came to power in France. Next, Vienna was struck by revolution and the Austrians were driven out of Milan by a popular rising. The Austrians retreated and as they did so, pressure grew for the Italian states to unite and drive out the Austrians once and for all. As conflict with Austria grew closer, Pius IX found himself in an impossible position. In April 1848, Pius IX denounced the war against Austria. This was a massive blow for all those who had looked to him for leadership, even though the idea that Papal Rome might lead the struggle against Catholic Austria had always been an illusion. But all those moderate nationalists now found themselves leaderless. This was when Charles Albert, the King of Piedmont, came on the scene. He took on the leadership of the struggle against Austria not because he sympathized with the nationalists, but because he wanted to halt the demands for wider political reform at home. In Piedmont, in Lombardy and in Venice, republicanism was rapidly gaining support. By leading the war against Austria, Charles Albert hoped to rally the support of all moderate and conservative nationalists and to stave off the threat of more radical political change. But on July the 24th, the Piedmontese army was defeated by the Austrians at the Battle of Custozza. Throughout northern Italy, the conservative leadership of the revolutions was now floundering. The moment had come, the radicals believed, to turn the king's war into the people's war. In Venice, Daniele Manin was already at the head of a republican government and the republicans were gaining strength in Piedmont, Tuscany and in central Italy. But the Republicans and the Radicals were also deeply divided. They agreed on little apart from wanting to get rid of the Austrians. Some supported Mazzini's plans for a unified Republic, but others, like Carlo Catania, wanted to see the Italian states become a federal Republic, like America or Switzerland. Personal and local rivalries were also strong 
and soon the radicals were fighting amongst themselves. Behind these squabbles, the sound of popular discontent was now also menacingly loud. Most Italians were peasants and farm workers. In the countryside, poverty was desperate and there was also a great shortage of land. One reason for this was rapid population growth. But equally important was the steady expansion of commercial farming. Enclosures had deprived many peasants of their land, while the loss of the village commons had destroyed the livelihood of whole communities. The peasants hoped that the revolutions would put an end to these changes. But this was impossible. Many landowners had supported the revolutions in the hope that they would speed up the pace of economic change. Even the radicals were firm believers in free trade and commercial expansion. Although they had appealed to the people for their support, they had little to offer them. And when the peasants understood this, they turned in fury against the revolutions that had betrayed their hopes. Amidst this growing confusion, Rome was for a short period to become the rallying point for the Democrats and the Radicals. In November 1848, the leader of the constitutional government in Rome was murdered. Pope Pius fled to Gaeta, and in February 1849, a republic was declared. Revolutionaries from all over Italy hurried to the city. Mazzini was invited to join the government. A democratic, republican constitution was adopted, and an ambitious program of political and social reforms was drawn up. But it was on the battlefield that the Roman Republic won enduring fame. Two armies had been sent to destroy the Republic, one by the King of Naples, who had given Pope Pius refuge, and the other by the Republican government in France, which hoped to win the support of French Catholics. Against overwhelming odds, the volunteer forces of the Republic delayed the advance of the French and Neapolitan armies. But it was here, on the Geniculo, overlooking the city, that the final attempt was made to defend the Republic. The operations were directed by Garibaldi, and when all further resistance became impossible, it was Garibaldi who organized the successful retreat of the defenders of the Roman Republic. So the revolutions ended with two crushing defeats. In May 1849, the Piedmontese army was defeated a second time by the Austrians at the Battle of Novara. Then at the end of June, the French troops finally overwhelmed the Roman Republic. After Novara, Charles Albert abdicated and was succeeded by his son. Piedmont was now the only constitutional government left in Italy, and its new ruler, Victor Emmanuel, became the champion of all those who wanted independence without radical political change. The attraction of Piedmont was increased because many Italians had been horrified by the anarchy that had swept through Italy in 1848 and 1849. They blamed this on the radicals. The radicals were still deeply divided, but their one symbol of unity was the Roman Republic. At the center of the image of the Republic was Garibaldi. The ex-seaman, the hero of two worlds, who had fought for liberty first in Latin America and then in Europe. Garibaldi had emerged from the revolutions as a man of simple integrity who stood above political squabble and intrigue. He was a Democrat, but unlike Mazzini, he was not identified with any particular political program. So the Roman Republic had given the radicals a new leader and also a new clear political goal. Rome or death, Roma or morte. For the time being, not only the future of Rome, but the struggle for independence as well was off the agenda.
the collapse of the revolutions had put Austria back in the saddle, and the presence of French troops in Rome added new complications. Any move against the Papal States would now risk provoking war with France. However, outside Italy, big changes nobody could have foreseen were at hand. In 1852, Louis Napoleon seized power in France and restored the empire. Shortly afterwards, the Crimean War revealed that Austrian power was declining. Despite the failure of the revolutions of 1848, political change in Italy was now a real possibility. It was against this background that Count Cavour, the Prime Minister of Piedmont, began the negotiations which led to the secret meeting with Napoleon III in 1858. In the following spring, Austria was provoked into war. In July, after terrible slaughter at the battles of Magenta and Solferino, the Austrians sued for peace. But Cavour wasn't after Rome. What he wanted was a new state in northern Italy. And he wanted to get it without giving away land to the French and without giving the nationalists a chance to upset his plans. Even the best laid plans go wrong. Although Cavour's supporters had organized the annexation of the central duchies to Piedmont, Napoleon III and Victor Emmanuel made peace with Austria before the Veneto had been liberated. The nationalists were outraged. Their chance to act came in 1860 when Piedmont gave Savoy to France along with the town of Nice where Garibaldi had been born. It was Garibaldi who gave the lead. At Quarto near Genoa he and his thousand volunteers set sail for Sicily. Their aim was to join an insurrection that had started near Palermo but their ultimate goal was to push on to Rome. The expedition was a direct challenge to the new state that Cavour had created in the north. After landing at Marsala, the thousand defeated the Bourbon armies in Sicily. Then, against all expectations, Garibaldi continued his victorious march onto the mainland and took Naples without firing a shot. Once Naples had fallen, the situation became critical. Garibaldi's declared aim was to liberate Rome, but this would have meant war with France. Cavour now played a dangerous but decisive hand and regained the political initiative. A Piedmontese army was sent through the Papal States to block Garibaldi's advance. Cavour's strategy could easily have led to civil war, but it didn't. In one of the most famous images of the Risorgimento, Garibaldi surrendered his command to Victor Emmanuel at Teano, near the frontier of the Papal States. Why had Garibaldi abandoned the march on Rome? In part because of his loyalty to Victor Emmanuel, but there were more important reasons too. Violent disorders were already beginning to spread through many parts of southern Italy. But more important, Garibaldi's own followers were still as deeply divided as ever. Their commitment to the liberation of Rome hadn't been enough to unite them. But although the radicals and democrats hadn't a clear political program, they had now succeeded in wrecking Cavour's plans for an Italian state in the north. The unification of the whole of Italy was now at last a possibility. But in 1861 this still didn't look any closer. The north and south had been united and Victor Emmanuel was crowned King of Italy. But the Veneto remained in Austrian hands and although the Pope had lost much of his territories, Rome was now under the protection of the Emperor Napoleon III and was therefore untouchable. Why didn't matters rest there? Well, Rome itself was the main reason. Rome had become an irresistible target for the nationalists. In 1862, 
Garibaldi again landed in Sicily and tried to relaunch the march on Rome. He managed to reach Calabria, but there he was stopped by Victor Emmanuel's troops in the Aspromonte Mountains and was wounded in the foot, much to the embarrassment of the Italian government. In 1866, Italy acquired Venice after Prussia had defeated the Austrians at the Battle of Sadua. And in the following year, the radicals made a final attempt to get to Rome, which ended in tragedy at Mentana. The quarrel with the church meant that Rome was also the main base for other powerful enemies of the new state. The quarrel with the papacy had started when Cavour set about reducing the church's powers in Piedmont. But after 1859, the situation became much worse. The Pope openly supported the deposed Italian rulers, while the new state was denounced as the negation of religion. From the pulpit, the priests incited the people to civil disobedience and even open resistance. The church's attitude strengthened anti-clerical feeling in Italy, as this image of Garibaldi in 1863 illustrates. And it deepened the rift between church and state. But the Pope's open opposition meant that the liberation of Rome remained a high priority for the Italian government. So to sum up, it was only once Napoleon III had been defeated at the Battle of Sedan that it became possible for Italy to acquire Rome. It was only once Rome had been acquired that the new state was at last secure. The way in which Rome and four years earlier Venice had been acquired showed the extent to which the struggle for Italian independence had been dominated by outside forces. But the shape of the new state had been fought out amongst the Italians themselves. Rome, like Italy, bore the deep marks of these conflicts. The battle with the church had seriously weakened the new state and left a question mark against its legitimacy. But the conflict with the papacy had also ensured that the new Italy would be a secular state, in other words, independent of the church and of the Pope. Italian Rome wasn't the Rome of the people. But the Rome of Victor Emmanuel was also very different from the old Piedmontese state. Unification had forced the Piedmontese monarchy to accept many changes. Unlike Prussia, Piedmont had not been able to unite Italy on its own. Reluctantly, Victor Emmanuel was forced to accept the realities of constitutional government, and although the landowners were the principal political force, the new Italy was not just Piedmont writ large. The new Italy wasn't what either Cavour or the radicals had wanted either, but at a certain moment, events and political conflicts had taken on a momentum of their own. Inevitably, the new state fell far short of what many Italians had hoped for, and at the same time far exceeded what others had wanted. But 1870 really wasn't the end of the story, only the beginning. With the acquisition of Rome came to an end the struggle for independence. The enemies of the new state were defeated, its geographical boundaries were fixed, its political tone was established. The work of state building had been completed, but the more difficult task of nation building and of unifying the Italian people had only just begun. Whether that was to succeed is another question and another story.
så måste man också kunna behärska talandes konst. När Anne Brennan, hemmafru i London, ger sig in i politiken så får hon en rent vetenskapligt utformad utbildning. Hos Royal Shakespeare Company lär hon sig behärska rösten. Harold Wilsons rutinerade spökskrivare visar hur man bygger upp ett anförande kring de rätta applådknipande poängerna. Och Dr. Max ett hjälper henne att analysera de mest framgångsrika talarnas knep. Resultatet blir imponerande. Programmet ingår i utbildningsradions serie Urval av SVT-program. Max Atkinson spends his life studying videotapes of top politicians talking. There is only one banner that Britain flies. The one it's kept flying for centuries. The red, white and blue. After analyzing hundreds of speeches, Dr. Atkinson has discovered the hidden rules of the word games played by politicians to make us applaud. Anne Brennan has never made a political speech in her life, and she's worried. A housewife who's only just got involved in politics, she will soon have to stand up and address a party conference. Um, I'm absolutely petrified of standing in front of this audience, but if someone is prepared to show me and teach me how to do it, then I'll be highly delighted to go along and have a go at it. World in Action challenged Dr. Atkinson to put his theories to the test, to reveal the tricks of the speaker's trade and transform Anne Brennan into an auditor. There is only one banner that Britain flies. Voices have been raised protesting... And some local authorities control by the thousand, million pounds... Anne lives in North London. Married to a taxi driver, she works part-time in an estate agent. Recently and reluctantly, she got involved in local politics. Basically, I never thought politics had much to do with me, really. Um, it was only sort of over the last few years where I, I thought, well, I'm not too happy. And if I feel like this, I felt the best thing for me to do, really, was to try to become involved. So I looked around and I thought, well, the SDP seems to be more the party for me, but having said that, um, 
I found that they were really middle class intellectual people, terribly nice, but really didn't relate to your everyday ordinary working class person. Um, they really didn't know the difficulties of perhaps living on a council estate, as I've done all my life. And um, I thought really to try to help them and to help the people who live on these estates, perhaps it's better if someone like me spoke to them. I suppose what you get, you get a lot of sort of kids and, and people like that, do you? Oh, well, is it, is I mean, even if the police was to chase anybody, Penneville Road, they run right up the staircase through here, right the way around, there's so many Yeah. Is it just ways. children or, like, you know, do you get problems with sort of winos or, or anything like the that? The winos, as I said, the prostitutes, you get children running here, especially at a dinner time. When I find it quite easy yeah, to yeah, talk to people face to face, and person to person. But what I've got to do when I get to Buxton is carry this argument into the hall. And the thought of standing up in front of four to five hundred people scares the living daylights out of me. But I feel I'm determined enough perhaps to get up there and do it.